Hello, hello. Welcome back to session 18, negative reinforcement. Go ahead and pause this. All right. Go ahead and get my pointer going in full screen. And a long, long time ago, back when I was in graduate school, I had to go through qualifying exams. I don't know if you guys have ever been through any qualifying exams or talked to anybody who has ever been through them. I prefer to refer to my uh, qualifying exams as my academic bar mitzvah. It was pretty much like that. It seemed like that. Um, and I rec recall that uh, during the two-day examination, one of my written uh, questions that was provided by Ed Malagodi was, why do organisms avoid aversive things? So I thought about that and realized that, you know, sometimes organisms do avoid aversive things. Certainly I avoid aversive things, but at other times, we as a species don't do a very good job of, of avoidance. Sometimes uh, we avoid quite poorly. Sometimes we avoid things better than other things. So I realized that what Malagoti was really asking me in this question was not why do organisms avoid aversive things, but when we ask why questions, what we're really asking is, under what conditions do organisms avoid aversive things? In other words, what Malagoti was obviously looking for was a complete literature review of negative reinforcement and the various types of avoidance procedures and paradigms that have been used to study this particular behavior over the years. Now, organisms do avoid aversive things, even the lowest of organisms. Here, check this out. This is a graph showing you a ciliated protozoan. And what you're looking at here is the number of stimulus presentations in this testing situation in which they're going to compare the effect of simply shocking the protozoa if you just provide light in the area, what do these animals do? And if neither light nor shock are provided, what generally do these animals do in these particular settings? So we're actually looking at these animals um, in a large test chamber, and we're examining the movement of these particular uh, protozoan. And what you can see here is uh, what it's looking at here. For the time the test period starts to the very end, three minutes, six minutes, nine minutes, and these are just separate trials, 369, 369. And what the uh, experimenters did was to pair light and electric shock. And you could see here, after numerous trials, what they started to see is, is that after you pair light with electric shock, as soon as the light comes on, and we're looking here at the avoidance type of response, these protozoa move to darker period areas of the chamber. What you see here is less and less and less of the protozoa stay in the lit area. In other words, what's happening here is, is that if we're looking at about a time that they spend in a particular area, once you pair light and shock, these protozoa <clears throat> learn very quickly to escape the light and move to darker areas of the chamber, showing you that you could actually get uh, an escape and avoided kind of response in a very small organism such as the protozoan. Later on, after I answered the question of the literature review, Malagoti asked me in my oral exams, why is aversive control used so much in societies and cultural practices? And that answer becomes pretty apparent, and we'll talk more about this later on when we get to cultural analyses. But it can be boiled down to simply that there's a cost-benefit of doing things using aversive control because they work quicker in the short run. That is, we oftentimes see aversive control used because in the short run, they are effective. But we also have to think about, in the long run, whether they really are effective. In other words, the cost-benefit of using aversive control usually benefits the people who are affected by changing these practices. Those who actually arrange the contingencies of aversive control do so because they themselves are negatively reinforced and are able to gain control quicker than using other techniques. However, that does not necessarily mean that aversive control is the method to use in our culture. And I would refer you to read some of the material in Pearson Cheney, in particular, uh, by Murray Sidman, where he talks about coercion and its dangers. Murray Sidman was, and, and somebody who we'll actually talk about shortly uh, when we get to the, uh, the Sidman avoidance procedure, uh, was one of the strongest advocates for 
uh, not using aversive control in our society. He wrote a book called Coercion, It's Fallout. Highly recommend it. It's a great book to have in your, um, in your behavioral library. So let's define negative reinforcement. And we defined this earlier in the section on opera conditioning, but it, it, it requires repeating. It is an increase in the frequency of the response or the maintenance of some sort of an avoidance or escape response. But the function is that it terminates an aversive event contingent upon that response. Okay? In the situation in which the responding literally terminates or shuts off an unconditioned or conditioned aversive stimulus, we are in fact escaping. Okay, because in order to escape, you must be in the presence of this stimulus, unconditioned or conditioned, so that your response literally does terminate the, uh, uh, the event. So in other words, if you have a headache, for example, reaching for Tylenol or ibuprofen terminates the headache. So we are literally escaping the headache. In the avoidance situation, avoidance responses prevent the unconditioned or conditioned aversive stimulus taking place. In other words, we are not necessarily in the presence of the aversive event, but we respond and we are able to prevent the events from actually occurring. So in this situation up here, we take if we get a headache, we are escaping the headache by taking Tylenol. On the other hand, if we have an upcoming meeting, and in those meetings in the past we've had headaches, by taking uh, Tylenol before the meeting, we might actually prevent the headache from coming on. Key words when we talk about negative reinforcement are delay, postpone, or generally overall reduce the aversive event. So I want to clarify a little bit because a lot of times people get confused in, between negative reinforcement and punishment. So let's go through this because the confusion comes from clarifying what it is that aversive stimuli do with respect to behavior. Stimuli which maintain escape or avoidance behaviors, okay, Behaviors will increase with those, uh, those opportunities that remove those stimuli. Again, so what we're looking at here is that with negative reinforcement, you're in the presence of a stimulus or there is a stimulus that's about to impinge upon the organism and a behavior will be emitted and will increase in frequency if it removes, escape, delays, or postpones that aversive event. In other words, we're talking about response acquisition and maintenance of a behavior that pushes away aversive stimuli. And by the way, that is the defining feature in an aversive event. It maintains escape and avoidance responding. Okay? Of course, what could also happen is you could have ongoing operant behavior that's being reinforced in another situation. And when that behavior occurs, we present aversive stimuli contingent on that behavior. Now, okay, we could call these stimuli coercive or punishing types of procedures. But in this situation, a child may be engaged in something like uh, reaching for a cookie jar and the parent comes along and sees the child up there and punishes the child, maybe gives him a little spanking on his or her fanny, and the behavior of reaching up and finding the cookie jar uh, goes down in frequency and no longer does the child climb on the stool to get to the cookie jar. We have seen here that punishment has taken place. Now, we're going to spend more time talking about punishment and negative reinforcement in the next two units. Okay? For now, we're going to concentrate on this scenario in which aversive stimuli uh, set the occasion for responding to occur, and that response is primarily maintained by the removal of aversive stimuli that impinge upon the organism. The first scenario we're going to talk about is escape and avoidance, is actually escape. But first, I'll share with you a little cartoon here. I always like the far side. <laughs> and what you see here is the child's crying is being punished. Every time Danny cries, right? Thump, 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 thump. The monster's in the basement. And now we hope to see, or dad hopes to see, a decrease in the frequency of Danny crying. But now he's also setting up an, uh, an avoidance situation, right? That is, if you be real quiet, he won't come. In other words, 
crying will get punished. However, this punishment here sets a very good uh, situation up to tell Danny that all you have to do is be real quiet and you could escape and avoid the monster. Okay. So you see here, one behavior goes down, crying. The behavior we hope to see increase in frequency, quiet behavior, because that's the avoidance response. Let's talk about escape. In this experiment, Dinsmore and Winograd were studying the effect of shock intensity on variable interval escape responding. So what was going on here was electric shock was being presented in the, in the chamber, uh, the grid floor, and, uh, and a rat had to respond to turn off the electric shock. Now, the electric shock uh, shutoff was arranged on a variable interval one minute. That is, the shock is turned on, it stays on in the chamber. The first response on the average, after two minutes, will turn the electric current off on the floor and keep it off for two full minutes, what was called a two-minute safety period. After two minutes passed, the electric shock would be turned on again on the grid floor, and once again, the first response on the average after two minutes would turn off the electric shock for a two-minute safety period. And what Dinsmore and Rindergrad were interested in studying was once you have established this avoidance paradigm, what happens when you adjust an increase or decrease shock intensity. In other words, if we increase shock, what happens to avoidance responding? Or I should say escape responding. If we lower the shock intensity, what happens to the escape response? Obviously, we would suspect that if we increase the shock intensity, we might get more robust responding to turn it off. And perhaps, if the shock is not as intense, you might get a decrease in the amount of respondent that goes on. Okay. Now, note here, very important to, to, to point out here, is that remember that interval schedules are time-based. They're not response-based. And these do not have the contingencies built into them, which says the faster you respond on the lever, the faster you shut off shock. Remember, these are not ratio contingencies here. These are interval contingencies. And therefore, it's on the average every two minutes. Responding faster by this rat will not turn electric shock off any faster than responding slow. It will only happen when this interval times out. So therefore, if we increase the amount of uh, responding, if the rats increase the rate of responding when we increase the shock intensity, this really shouldn't make much sense because increasing the response rate does not decrease shock intensity. It doesn't alter it one bit. It just simply either turns it off, it keeps it off, and will do so only when the contingency is met. And what we find out, we introduce these changes in shock intensity. Okay, The functional relationship between the shock intensity and the response rate may be direct related or inversely related, depending on how we introduce shock. Let me show you what I mean. What you see here is that in a situation in which, again, these are cumulative graphs, right? Responding steps up the pen. And these little pep marks indicate changes in shock intensities. So what you see here is at the very beginning of the session, if we were to introduce electric shock starting off with 100 milliamps, it's, you could see it, it sustains a very low rate of responding, which is approximately what? About one response per minute. Or uh, This is a response rate of uh, here. You can see that. If we change the shock intensity, we see an increase when we go to 400 milliamps. Response rate goes up. If we change the shock intensity now and go to 50 milliamps, response rate goes down to very close to maybe a little bit lower than at 100 milliamps. Go up to 300 milliamps, response rate goes up. What happens if we completely turn off the electric shock? What happens to response rate? Well, no surprise here. They stop responding because there's no more electric shock. Turn the shock on again at 200, and they start responding again. So based on this information, one might conclude that 100, you get a little bit of responding, 50 a little bit, 
400 we get more responding 300 we get a little bit less it would appear that when you arrange and go from 100 to 400 to 50 to 300 to 0 to 200 and arrange the shock delivery in this jumbled up order it seems like that as shock intensity increases rate of responding increases in other words it would appear that we have a seemingly direct relationship between shock intensity and response rate based on the fact that we get this kind of result really happens primarily when it's in this jumbled up order because what happens if we were to present those same stimuli in the following order suppose we go from 50 milliamps to 100 to 200 to 300 to 400 and actually increase it in this manner like this and what you see here is that increasing shock intensity in that manner actually has an, in, uh, an inhibitory effect on responding okay something to think about because there are a lot of times in which we see individuals in which we use uh, fines, for example, that we tell people, if you don't get this in on time, you will be fined. And for every day or two days that you're late, we're going to increase the amount of fines more and more and more. So if you get parking tickets, you might have to pay a small fee. But after a period of time, if you don't pay that parking ticket, the amount uh, builds up more and more and more and more over time until you reach a point at which the amount of fines that a person has to face becomes so great they cannot make an operant response in other words every time they try to do something it gets them into hotter and hotter water you can see here at 100 milliamps they're trying to avoid but look what happens we change it now it's 200 milliamps they avoid we ch and a after active avoiding, we change it, and now it's 300 milliamps. In other words, avoiding is not being met with any degree of satisfaction of lowering the intensity. It's not really removing the aversive event. In fact, it's not doing much of anything. So what you're st slowly seeing here is the extinction of a negatively reinforced response. Because when you result in greater and greater increases, it is no longer escaping those aversive events okay all right now we could also arrange situations in which we could signal the availability of shock at any moment by using signaled avoidance procedures and I'm going to show you how this is arranged how it's Hoffman arranged this you see here a situation in which we arrange light which starts off as a neutral stimulus it turns on stays on and then if no response occurs during this period you can see no response occurs electric shock is delivered and the light shuts off after a period of time we wait the light is off we turn the light on again it's on and stays on and again no response after a period of time, the light shuts off and shock is delivered immediately. A little bit longer, light comes on, stays on, and then before the light goes off and shock is delivered, you can see here a response occurs. The lever press in this situation shuts off the light and avoids the electric shock. In other words, we have escaped the light and avoided shock. A little bit further time passes all of a sudden that light comes on again however in this situation the rat fails to make a response and because of its failure the light terminates electric shock now time passes and now the light doesn't even come on if the rat starts pressing the lever look what starts happening presses the lever now the rat is postponing both the light and the shock makes another response postpones light and electric shock time passes no response light comes on stays on rat responds when the light is on turns off the light and now avoids electric shock this is called a signal avoidance procedure and in this situation which is a free operant avoidance procedure we see here that this warning light which starts off neutral over time becomes a conditioned aversive stimulus 
That is, before it does not maintain behavior, but by virtue of the fact that it's paired with shock, now you see that all of a sudden, avoidance responding starts to take place. And it starts doing so when the light is on. The light has become a condition aversive stimulus by virtue of this pairing operation. So let's go back and describe again. The signal, the light, becomes a condition aversive stimulus. And in this particular pairing, uh, pairing arrangement, conditioning is usually rapid and consistent. And usually 99, or I should say 95 to 99% of the shocks are usually avoided. Rats pick up and do this pretty well, and they learn it pretty quickly. However, note here, and this is going to be very important because this is on your exam, in this paradigm, 100% of these shocks could be avoided theoretically. right? And you see that right here. All the rat has to do is respond again and again and again every once in a while when there's no light, or if a light comes on, get over there and make that response on the lever and shut off the light. And theoretically, in a free operative avoidance paradigm such as this, 100% of the electric shocks theoretically could be avoided. Okay, So I'll put this down here. However, I want to point out, even though theoretically it could, in fact, they don't actually get up to 100%. They get pretty high, but they don't get up quite to 100%. All right. Now, in this situation, theorists came out by the droves and started looking at this particular avoidance paradigm and started to describe that there were actually two things that were going on in signaled avoidance. Two kinds of conditioning, respond to conditioning and operant conditioning. Respond to conditioning took place because the signal became an aversive stimulus via respond to conditioning. In other words, via this operation here of light shock, light shock, light shock, it is much more of a type of a um, respondent paradigm, seemingly respondent par uh, conditioning paradigm. Light is simply being paired with shock. Light becomes an aversive stimulus via this conditioning process. However, having that pairing operation is just simply not enough. At some point, the rat has to do something, and that's lever pressing. And lever pressing is not involved with respond to conditioning or respond to behavior. That is operant conditioning. In other words, the rat has, uh, by, by making the escape and avoidance response, that successfully removes both the light, the condition aversive stimulus, and the electric shock. And if responding does not remove that, responding will simply go away. So in other words, you have to have two things going on here. It seems that in the early theories that through this pairing of light and shock, the light seems to give rise to what might actually be respondent behaviors, maybe elicited behaviors. That is, it, the responding looks very much not like the parasympathetic nervous system operating, but the sympathetic nervous system operating. If you watch animals in this paradigm, they're pretty revved up. You know, They may scramble around the chamber. When that light comes on, sometimes they'll scramble around. Sometimes they'll actually even freeze. You know, That light comes on, they're just like, like a deer in the headlights, and they just simply sit there and brace themselves for the electric shock. Other rats will be highly activated and start looking around and running around the chamber, just scurrying around and scurrying around as much as possible. That may actually be some degree of what has been considered excitation, physiological excitation by the electric shock, that it just does that. However, it's simply not enough to be revved up and emotional and raring to go. you got to do the right thing at the right time, and that's where operant conditioning comes in. It's almost as if uh, this type of paradigm has the rat dressed up with no place to go until it learns the right response, and only then will it actually improve its life. Respond to conditioning and respond to behavior does not really necessarily make contact with the external world and consequences, but operant behavior does because it involves skeletal movement and so on. All right. A second kind of avoidance that we're going to talk about is called free operant or unsignal. That is, what are those situations in which, obviously, we're pretty good at responding to signals, and we do so very, very readily. If you are driving, 
on you know the interstate on I-25 and you're down in the Pueblo area and there's not a soul in sight and you're cruising 75 and then you decide to push it a little bit and go to 80 then 85 and then 90 and you're really cruising along and in the opposite direction somebody comes along and flashes their headlights or your radar detector you know makes a noise that is a great example of signal avoidance because when that signal comes on respond now escape the headlights, you know, <laughs> escape the, the noise, uh, and just simply step on the brake and you will avoid getting a ticket. So we set up and have in our environments lots of these avoided stimuli. The gas gauge on our, on our gas tank, which tells us that you're getting close to empty. Make a response, go in, fill up, and you'll be able to uh, not run out of gas. Uh, going in and getting uh, checkups are a good thing to do. Annual checkups, you know, mammograms, all of these things are avoidance responses because if you could go in and find these things out early, you may be able to turn things around. You may be able to get heart medication so that you could lower your heart rate so you don't get a heart attack. You may be able to detect something on the mammogram that could turn out to be quite benign if you catch it early enough. So there again is an avoidance response because to not respond to it, to ignore the signals, actually places you at more risk. So there are really a lot of life examples of signal avoidance. But there are also times in which we don't necessarily have signals, but we don't necessarily fall apart. And that was what Sidmund was actually studying. He set up a very simple paradigm in which he had two shocks uh, clock, clocks that delivered electric shock um, to, these, to the organism. One was a... Um, called the signal-signal sh uh, uh, shock, in which a signal would occur, I'm sorry, a shock would occur, and if no responding occurs after the first shock, another shock will occur, and then another shock will occur. And these shocks were scheduled to occur at approximately every five seconds. So when the rat's placed in the chamber, and the shock is turned on, shock is going to be delivered, little brief electric shocks every five seconds. That's if no responding occurs. If a response occurs, this clock shuts off and this clock turns on, which is actually set at another value. Let's set this one, say, at 20 seconds. So if you respond on the lever and keep responding before shock occurs, you just keep resetting this clock again and again and again. Okay? As it draws down from 20 seconds to 19 to 18, it gets closer to zero. Get that response in there, and you could actually reset this clock and never get shot. However, if you're on this clock, and it times out, and it goes to zero, and you don't make a response, you get shocked here, this clock shuts off, and now this clock turns on, and now you're going to get shocked every five seconds until another response occurs. Okay, does that make sense to you? Let's look at another analog to doing this. Let's put Sidman avoidance into the future, and let's set up the brand new kind of arrangement of uh, uh, parking meters. So now we are going to catapult ourselves into the 20th, 22nd century. Okay? And in the 20th second century, uh, we pull our vehicle into a space, and the minute we pull our vehicle into a space, it reads a barcode off of our wheels, it's unavoidable because it's a, it's a simple type of a signal detection sort of a, an arrangement. So that you pull into the space, the space knows, so to speak, who you are, what car you drive, and immediately it begins to arrange to set you up to put money into the meter. So what you have to do is you park your car, it knows who you are, and you put your credit card in there, and you punch in that I'll be in for about one hour. Now, you could only put one hour at a time into this parking meter, okay? Now, if, you, if your hour runs out, you're going to get a ticket. However, within that hour, anytime you come back to your parking meter and put money into it by, you know, swiping your credit card, you know, through the machine, you could reset that one hour again and again and again and never get a ticket. Actually, this is not much different than parking meters today. I go into Denver all the time and, and, and there's a parking uh, lot that I have to park at. And it's the same thing. It has a maximum amount of time. 
I have a certain amount of time to get out of the building at, at, at uh, UC Denver, run across the street, uh, put my money into the meter, reset it, and then run back into the building and so on. Okay, So that would be a one-hour RS interval. However, we're in the 22nd century, and as soon as I get nailed by this, by not getting out in time, rather than just giving me one ticket, now it's set up that every five minutes that passes that I don't put a ticket in, that I don't put money in there, it's going to give me a ticket, and then another ticket, then another ticket, and then another ticket every five minutes until I get off my butt, go down there, swipe my credit card through the machine, and reset this interval again. That is SIDMAN avoidance. Okay? Now, certain things should become pretty apparent to you in doing this. First of all, if I'm really good at doing this and get down there and just keep you know, feeding the meter, so to speak, I can avoid 100% of the tickets. And in Sydney, I'm responding approximately once every 20 seconds, if that was the RS interval. Okay. However, we should note here that if we look at the rate at which I put quarters into the machine, if I know that meter is at one hour, okay, I'll probably get down there close to every hour. So the frequency of me putting and swiping the machine is maybe about once an hour. What happens if I actually uh, go to the machine and I could note that the meter lasts for instead of one hour, four hours? Well, then I'm probably going to run down there closer to every four hours. In other words, as the RS interval gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the rate of responding goes down because I don't have to get in there and make a response because that interval is getting bigger and bigger. But if that interval gets shorter, instead of going for every one hour, what happens if it's now every 30 minutes that I have to get down there and put my, uh, swipe the, uh, the, the meter, right? It means I'm going to be going down there again and again and again at a higher frequency. So as the RS interval gets shorter and shorter, rate of responding is increasing in frequency, right? So that they could get into that and avoid the electric shocks. Note also here that animals are able to avoid shocks in this situation, and therefore a signal is not always necessary to make an avoidance response. Okay, And I'm going to show you here that the acquisition of responding in a rat happens pretty rapidly. What you're looking at here is the slope of the line of cumulative records. Each one of these hash marks indicates a shock is delivered. All right? And you can see here at the very beginning of the first hour, the rat has got a very low rate of responding, right? And again, the RS interval is 20 seconds, SS interval is 5 seconds. And a low rate of responding means that he's getting shocked more often than, than not, particularly here. But look what happens. As he, the rat becomes a more successful avoidance responder, the frequency of electric shock is going down across the sessions. See, as rate goes up in terms of the slope of the line, shock frequencies go down. However, note here that even though they can theoretically avoid 100% of the electric shocks, rats, in fact, do not uh, reach 100%. And again, there's a logical reason that this should actually take place. Right? In other words, if you are an avoider and you are successfully avoiding uh, the more you're able to avoid, the less likely you, that you're pairing light with shock. Okay, Think about this. Let's go back for one second, and this will make sense to you. If you gain an avoidance response by virtue of the fact that light and shock and light and shock and light and shock are constantly be, be, being paired, the more they're paired, the more effective you're going to be in learning to escape and avoid the electric shock. But now that you become very successful... In avoiding electric shock, you see right here, here's a situation in which um, uh, you, uh, the, rat, uh, the rat emits a response, no light, no shock. And here we see a situation where uh, light is presented, respond, no shock. So if we become successful that we see the light come on and we respond that we don't get shock, what happens over time? We're unlearning. The very thing that made the learning process take place of pairing light and shock goes away as you become a successful avoider because you see here 
to avoid successfully means that the light is no longer paired with shock. And now it's unpairing, and it weakens the association. And what you have here is this recycling of, you know, a period of time passes, period of time passes, until all of a sudden, you let down your guard, you fail to make an escape response, light comes on, right? Light goes off, shock's delivered, and the pairing process takes place again. And then you go, oh yeah, that's right. I got to remember to... <laughs> escape and avoid this kind of stuff. So these are some of the pitfalls that we have that the very procedure that establishes successful avoidance behavior comes along and goes away and undoes that very behavior because you're no longer pairing light with electric shock. Okay. All right. And what this actually shows you here is the effect when the RS interval is very, very long you don't have a whole lot of escape responding. As I mentioned to you before, is that if I go from a parking meter that, that I have to feed once an hour to every four hours, the rate of me feeding the parking meter goes down. But as that RS interval gets shorter and shorter and shorter, it means that it's going from four hours to three hours to two hours to one hour. Now I'm going to start feeding the machine a lot more because that RS interval is getting shorter and shorter. And the same thing's holding true here with the rat. When the RS interval is at 150 seconds, the rate of responding is very low. But as we start shortening that RS interval to a point, it gets higher and higher and higher until you reach a point at which the RS interval almost is identical to the shock-shock interval. And when, in fact, the RS interval is shorter than the shock-shock interval, responding stops entirely. Why? Because they're going to get shocked more frequently by responding, they might as well just stop responding on the lever and just get shocked once every five seconds. You can see that happens here. When the shock-shock interval is at five seconds, but the RS interval is much shorter than that, they stop responding, and therefore avoidance behavior is no longer maintained. So now we step back and think about this. What happens to two-factor theory? Right? In other words, two-factor theory is pretty easy explanation to use when you have a signal that is the signal becomes aversive because the signal is paired with electric shock, right? Light shock, light shock. That's pretty obvious in terms of the respond to conditioning paradigm part of it. But what happens in segment avoidance? There is no light. In other words, what is the exteroceptive or external stimulus, if not a light or a buzzer, that's controlling the behavior of the rat? Well, the only way we could kind of maintain two-factor theory of avoidance is to assume that the passage of time becomes a conditioned aversive stimulus. That is just simply, as time passes, without getting an electric shock, it sets the occasion that the passage of time without a shock becomes an aversive event. Okay? However, it becomes a little bit vague because what is going on with this passage of time? What behavior is changing? If there's no extraroceptive stimulus, what is the interoceptive stimulus that is involved in this? What stimuli may be going on inside the organism, if any, that might be controlling it? And we get into some tricky water here by trying to figure out what that might actually be. If we talk about the passage of time, and this is the problem with these kinds of concepts, we automatically evoke that if there's a passage of time, there must be an internal clock inside the organism, and now we're on the verge of inventing mentalistic causes, such as a clock, that is responsible for this particular behavior. But we have no evidence of any kind of an internal clock. We have no evidence that something you know, is a digital format, or an analog clock, that it's made by Seiko, or perhaps Timex. These are nothing more than metaphors that Anger and others are using to explain something that's not readily explainable. However, how do we come to account for something when there is no external stimulus? Is there another solution, rather than the mentalistic one, of explaining an internal cognitive cause, something which literally tracks time when there is no external light or tones? Well, we certainly started looking at this in the experimental analysis behavior and doing more research and one of the researchers that come along was Phil Heinlein, who introduced a procedure called shock frequency reduction. Now, in this situation, again, there were two simple clocks that were operating. 
one clock was distributing electric shock at a fairly high probability. Another clock was operating that would deliver shock at a lower probability. That is, which is up here, every two seconds that passed, there was a 30% chance that you were going to get shocked. Just a quick electric shock. And then another two seconds passes, again, 30% chance that you're going to get shocked. This would happen again and again when this clock operated. Now, any time that the organism made a response in this, in this situation, an, an escape response or an avoidance response, the avoidance response would turn off this clock and turn on this clock, in which every two seconds it passes, instead of a 30% chance of shock, there's only a 10% chance of shock. In other words, life improves to some degree by 20% just by avoiding responding you could get into a lower probability of getting shocked over here. Now, according to the way Heinlein arranged this, though, he had set it up that, that any time a rat got shocked up here, he stayed up in this situation again and again. If the rat made an avoidance response, he shut off shot, uh, clock one and went down to clock number two and now got shocked less often. If the rat got shocked down here under this condition, he got bumped back up to the high probability clock in which there was high frequency shock again. The only way to get back down to this world down here of less shock and less aversiveness is to maintain an avoidance response. However, unlike Sidman avoidance and unlike signal avoidance, remember in those two previous paradigms, the rat could just simply keep responding again and again and again, and if it did so, it could avoid 100% of the shocks. In Heinlein, uh, Hernstein Heinlein avoidance, or what we call shock frequency reduction, that is not established here. That is, you're going to get shocked here, you're going to get shocked there. There's no way of 100% avoiding the aversive events. However, avoidance does lower the density and frequency of electric shock. Would that be sufficient to maintain avoidance behavior? Okay. And what you find out, in fact, that it does. Okay. That is, as long as the, the shock frequency uh, clock, and I should say, as long as this clock, at, or I should say at 10%, is lower than 30%, you will uh, sustain avoidance responding. Okay. And that will only work, like I said, if you could lower the overall frequency of electric shock by 30% to 10%. If we raise it and go from 30 and go down to 0 0.005, a bigger shock frequency reduction, you're going to get really nice sustained avoidance, even though you're going to get zapped here every once in a while. That sends you right back up here. Overall, this is a better place to be. But when this number goes from 0.1 to 0 0.2, ah, it's not as much of a low probability. It's not as much of a reduction. So you'll see a change in the avoidance behavior. And of course, if this becomes 0.3 and that becomes 0.3 and there's no difference between this distribution and that distribution, you should see avoidance behavior completely drop out. And that's what actually does happen. So for Herdstein and Heinlein, it became clear that the important variable was not two-factor theory, as was stated by uh, the early theorists, and certainly you don't have to invoke uh, some sort of mentalistic explanation, such as an internal clock, interoceptive stimuli controlling this. In fact, what Hernstein and Heinlein were able to do was reduce the two-factor theory to one simple explanation. That is, one factor explains everything. Shock frequency reduction. That is, if you could set up a paradigm that reduces the overall frequency of a reversive event, it will sustain avoidance behavior. When you can no longer reduce the frequency of electric shock, avoidance behavior goes away. In other words, instead of evoking respondent and opera conditioning, all you have to worry about is its opera conditioning. And again, in the terms of the law of parsimony, if you could account for avoidance behavior using one, one variable, there's no reason to start talking about things such as respondent conditioning, and there's certainly no reason to start talking about things that you cannot see that explain nothing, such as 
internal biological clocks. Okay? Again, that's not to say that behavior and neurological pathways and these things do not change over time. That's true. And we know that already. Uh, neurological uh, systems do degrade over time. We see that in terms of brain tissue. We know enough about dementia and Alzheimer's to make very clear, accurate predictions based on changes in the neurological tissue. But we are not simply talking about clocks. We're not talking about uh, metaphors. We're really talking about changes in physiological tissue that could be traced and actually recorded okay, through MRIs and PET scans and so forth. Now, do we have all the pieces to the puzzle here? At this point, in 19, late 66 and 67, we thought that we had a pretty good handle on avoidance until another researcher came along. Okay. Now, at this point, I'm going to stop for a second and explain something to you that I really love about the experimental analysis of behavior. Uh, as a kid growing up, I used to love mysteries, murder mysteries and so forth. I, I was a big reader of... Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle used to read all of the uh, Sherlock Holmes and the Agatha Christie novels. And to this day, I just really enjoy mysteries. And in a lot of ways, the experimental analysis of behavior gives me the opportunity to be an experimental psychologist uh, and others to be experimental psychologists to be able to rule out and solve problems. And at this point, as I mentioned to you, a lot of people were, were banking on the fact that it was all shock frequency reduction that accounted for everything. All you have to do is reduce the frequency of aversive events and that's enough to maintain the behavior. And that sort of does make sense at an intuitive level if you think about it. right? All things considered, there are certain things that we have to do, but if we delay, it's going to get worse. The longer we wait, the worse things get. It does make sense to actually respond earlier even though we don't necessarily remove all the aversive events, uh, we could respond quickly to avoid uh, having them build up. So, for example, in Massachusetts, uh, I used to hate having to rake leaves every fall. I knew that if you maintain and rake your leaves you know, frequently enough, uh, you could actually control it pretty readily. The longer you wait to rake up your leaves, the worse it becomes and the more aversive it becomes. Same thing holds true with mowing your lawn. It's never a thrill for me to mow my lawn in Colorado or in Massachusetts, but I certainly know that if I'm going to have to get out there, I'd rather get out there and do it maybe once a week because if I wait two weeks, the grass is twice as high. It's much more of a hassle. I have to empty the bag or I have to rake up a lot more of the debris, a lot more, and it's a big pain in the butt. Okay, so again, there's my avoidance response. There's, it's always going to be aversive, but it's a lot less aversive to do it quicker and get it done rather than letting it pile up, whether we're talking about grass, dirty laundry, dirty dishes, paying bills, doing your taxes, uh, as well as other health things. The longer we delay going to the doctors, the worse it's going to be. Going to the dentist is not much fun. You know, but if you get, at least get your teeth cleaned once every three months or every four months or every six months, that's a lot better than having to go every two or three years and take the risk that not only do you have to get your teeth cleaned and they have to, you know, literally break out, you know, Mr. Clean or some sort of, you know, detergent on your teeth to get them clean, but there's also a good chance that you've got cavities, that you also may develop some sort of gingivitis, which leads to root canal problems and so forth. So in that sense, looking at it at a cultural level, shock frequency reduction makes a hell of a lot of sense. And it always did to many of the researchers until Gardner and Lewis came along and presented a great experiment to say, not so. This will take a little bit of time to explain it, and this is going to be one of them, their long experimental sessions. I'll make it up to you by cutting the next couple of them shorter. So let's go through this last experiment. What Gardner and Lewis did was to set up a condition in which rats were put into a chamber. This, by the way, is a group experimental design again. All of the rats were exposed to what's called the imposed condition in which, on the average, every 30 seconds that passes, if the rat makes no response on the lever, shock is going to be delivered. Okay? In other words, this is going to happen 
Shots delivered, all this kind of a schedule, this VT schedule, is sort of similar. Think back to the superstition experiment that we talked about with Skinner, in which he placed pigeons in a chamber, and every 15 seconds, regardless of what the pigeon did, food was delivered to the pigeon every 15 seconds. That was called an FT, 15 seconds, called fixed time. Fixed time schedules, and this is actually VT called variable time schedules, these are called response-independent schedules of reinforcement. Uh, these are the schedules, by the way, that you, if you haven't read about them, uh, you will certainly cover this in later sessions. Uh, in many of the research designs in reducing self-injurious behavior, they deliver something called non-contingent reinforcement. Okay? This is very similar to this. It's a response-independent schedule of reinforcement. However, in this situation, it's a variable uh, schedule, variable time schedule, and rather than food being delivered, a brief so it makes the experiment make sense. If this happens on the average approximately every 30 seconds, right, then within a three minute period in this condition, about how many electric shocks should you get? Okay, this is like a Jeopardy question, right? Every 30 seconds on the average, after three minutes, how many shocks should you have probably delivered in this condition? All right, and the answer would be roughly six shocks will occur every three minutes in this condition. Got it? Okay. Now, in this condition, there is a lever in the chamber, but this is a funky kind of a lever, unlike the ones that we described before. This is called a retractable lever. And this kind of lever is actually on a little motorized drive sort of a thing that at the push of a button or based on the program that the experimenter designs, this lever could actually be put into the chamber and pulled out of the chamber without the experimenter actually opening up the door and pulling it in and out. It's literally on a motor drive. Okay, so it's almost like you're sitting there and you could actually watch this lever come in from the wall, from, the, uh, from, in, from outside the wall, and it moves, you know, a couple, of, a couple of millimeters a second, and after about five seconds, the lever's in the chamber. If we decide that we want to remove the opportunity to respond on the lever, we could program that too. And in this situation, this is exactly what happened. Uh, this, a second condition was introduced for the rats, depending on which group you were in. And this provided delay shock in which if you press the lever in this condition, the lever will be removed for three minutes. You stay in the alternate condition, and there is a delay. And then after the delay, there will be six electric shocks delivered, one right after another. Let me illustrate how this goes, so it will make it really clear how this works. Okay. By the way, we're going to have three groups of rats. Group number one is going to have a 10-second delay. Group two is going to have an 88-second delay. And group three is going to have a 165-second delay. So let me show you in this, uh, in, in this uh, diagram how this works. Here we are with group number one, a group of rats, okay, uh, three rats. And this is called the imposed condition. VT 30 seconds is in place, okay? It's in place roughly for, th for uh, three minutes or as long as the rat uh, does not respond on the lever. And you can see here the rat gets shocked there, picks up a shock there. It's variably spaced on the average once every 30 seconds. And then the rat presses the lever right here, the retractable lever right there. At this point, when the rat presses the lever, the lever is pulled out of the chamber and there's no longer a response that can be made for the next three minutes. And now we are in the alternate condition. After 10 seconds for group one, the rat will get six electric shocks, one right after another, right? Shock, 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 shock. And then for the remainder of that three-minute period, safety. Absolutely no electric shock. When three minutes passes, the alternate condition ends and the imposed condition starts up again. The retractable lever is... Uh, put back into the chamber, and we are back into the imposed condition again until the rat pr presses the lever. And if the rat presses the lever, this condition stops, and we come back, and we are back here again. For group number two, they had the same condition. 
Group 2 had three rats starting off in the imposed condition, VT 30 seconds. On the average, every 30 seconds delivers a response-independent electric shock. The rat presses the lever in this situation, and that retractable lever is removed, and the rat finds himself, or herself, in the alternate condition, in which there is now an 88-second delay for this group of rats. 88 seconds passes. The rats pick up six electric shocks, one right after another. And then for the remainder of that three-minute period, safety. Nothing happening. After three minutes passes, the retractable lever comes into the chamber, and the rat is back in the imposed condition. Group 3 went through the same kind of training, except for Group 3, they had a 165-second delay in the alternate condition. That is, press the lever, the lever is removed, they're in the alternate condition, nothing happens for 165 seconds, then they get six shocks, one right after another, and then for the remainder of the three-minute period, no shock, and then they're back in this condition again. So what we're seeing here then, if you haven't guessed it, is that whether you're in this condition, the imposed condition, or the alternate condition, you're going to get six shocks here, or you're going to get six shocks here. These groups of rats will get either six shocks in three minutes, or six shocks in three minutes. Same thing here, six shocks in three minutes, six shocks in three minutes. In other words, if we're looking at whether the animal gets into the alternate condition to avoid electric shock based on delay, if according to Sidman avoidance, I'm sorry, according to Hernstein Heinlein avoidance, remember shock frequency reduction, none of these rats should ever respond to get in the alternate condition. Why? Because whether you're in the alternate and opposed condition, it's still six shocks. It's the same frequency of shock in both conditions. So therefore, if you get animals to avoid, there must be something else going on other than shock frequency reduction. Isn't that clever? Isn't that a great experiment? And what we find out here is that this is the amount of time spent in the alternate condition, the percent of time spent in the alternate condition. In other words, if you spend very little time in the alternate condition, it means that you didn't make a whole lot of avoidance responses. If you spent primarily 100% of the time in that alternate condition, it means that you spent almost the majority of the time in the alternate condition, not in the imposed condition. And what you can see here quite clearly, rats that had a 10-second delay spent roughly 5 to 10% of the time in the alternate condition on average. But as we increase the delay, look what happens to avoid its responding. It increases, and then the group that had the maximum delay spent the entire amount of time in the alternate condition, which kind of tells you uh, it is not necessarily shock frequency reduction. In other words, the more delay that you can get from the aversive event, the longer and the more avoidance responding you will sustain. Okay? In other words, we could actually draw a functional relationship here. Right? That is, as delay gets longer and longer, right, between electric shock, the avoidance response to the electric shock, the more avoidance behavior you're going to get. The longer you can put things off, you will. And this is what ends up happening to a lot of people. When they have to make an aversive event and do something, they just put it off and put it off and put it off. And in doing so, you know, uh, they just keep putting off the inevitable of getting the shock. Now, here's the interesting thing to ask yourself. Sometimes we, we know we're going to have to pay the piper sometime, right? We're going to have to do the aversive event. We've got to get it out of the way. And sometimes we find ourselves avoiding, avoiding, and finally we say, okay, we're just going to go ahead and do it. I don't want to do it, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. But what happens now when you finally have to actually make the avoidance response and now you are confronted with even more aversive stimuli. Is it still worth the avoidance response? In other words, wouldn't it be a clever idea if Gardner and Lewis came up with an experiment to really blow shock frequency reduction out of the water? Which is what they did do. They ran the second experiment, and again, right here, this kind of tells you, there's a direct relationship between shock delay and the amount of time spent in the alternate condition. The greater the shock delay, the more time spent in the alternate condition. And then we come to experiment two, in which Gardner and Lewis held the delay at 150 seconds for all 
groups of rats. Group 1, group 2, group 3 all got that 150 second delay. So if they pressed the lever and got to the alternate condition, they were all on 150 second delay and then they would get shocks. However, when they did get shocked, group 1 didn't get 6 shocks, they got 9 shocks. Group 2 got 12 shocks. Group 3 sustained 3 times more electric shock by going and staying in that alternate condition. Now you ask the question, is it really worth it to spend time and delay the inevitable when you're going to get nailed with three times the amount of aversive event? Does that, is that sufficient to get the animal to finally make the avoidance response earlier and not get into that alternate condition? And what you see here are the three groups of rats. Group number one. Remember, all groups of rats here had a 150 second delay. The one that got 1.5 the amount of electric shock, right, nine shocks, you see here that two of the rats no longer made the alternative response, the avoidance response, and stayed in the imposed condition. That is, these two rats stayed in the VT uh, 30 second shock. However, one rat continued to make that avoidance response. In this situation over here, uh, when it was twice the amount of electric shock, all of the rats continued to make the avoidance response, even when they were getting double the amount of electric shock. Virtually all three of those rats stayed in the alternate condition. And of course, over here, you see here that when, it, when we actually have a 150 second delay, but then when you actually get those shocks, you're going to get 12 shocks, I'm sorry, 18 shocks, that's three times the amount of electric shock. Two rats completely bagged it and stayed in the imposed condition. One rat continued to stay in the, uh, in the alternate condition and take that punishment, that, that, that shock, even though it could have lowered the overall frequency by just taking it early in the unpredictable situation here. So now we kind of wonder, isn't that interesting? Uh, it gets back to the original question that I asked, or that was asked me, by qualifying exams. Under what conditions do organisms avoid aversive things? And clearly, we see there are multiple conditions under which we make avoidance responses. Sometimes these are not cleanly uh, isolated situations, such as this one and this one. We wonder why in the world this rat would do this when this is the smart thing to do. Right? But then again, we do make these kinds of mistakes. We continue to make decisions now instead of making hard avoidance decisions that we should be making now and put off and put off the inevitable. One of these things has to do with how we come to borrow money. We could either not engage in behavior, we could borrow money, we could borrow money and pay it off as quickly as possible, or we could borrow and continue to borrow and use credit cards and put more things on credit card and continue to push off the inevitable of having to make these payments. So it's interesting that when we look at our culture now and we have this massive debt that we are accumulating and we are asking these kinds of questions. Do we stop the spending now and start dealing with these issues today, or do we just continue to put off and put off this debt and put it onto the shoulders of our children and grandchildren? Now, that seems like a pretty wild kind of a question to come out of this, but as you could see where we're going with this kind of thing, there's no reason to assume that the variables that control these different behaviors in rats are going to be any different with human behavior, because some rats are able to sustain and make a, a decision that in the long run leads to overall fitness for these two rats. A rat that undergoes this kind of situation for a long period of time is probably not going to be physiologically fit and probably die at a very, very early age more than likely by undergoing so much electric shock and stress. Okay? And we do have individuals and cultures that do make these decisions. Some make logical, successful decisions and deal with debt immediately. Others continue to make poor decisions and, be, and just continue to pass the debt on and on and on. Okay? So, when we look at this situation, we come away and say that avoidance depends on a number of things. There is no one theory that under some conditions, avoidance behavior is maintained. Other other conditions, avoidance behavior may or may not be maintained. 
these are all the variables that I wanted you to be aware of because when you come to do functional assessments and functional analyses in which you're going to look at a lot of escape and avoidance behavior that is maintained, uh, for example, if we place a request on a per, uh, to a person and say, could you please do this, and they engage in aggressive behavior and we remove that request and demand, that's classic escape and avoidance behaviors. And you're going to find that the functional assessment tools uh, of using whether we're using a QABF or a FAST uh, are useful tools to identify that it is escape and avoidance. But which one is it? Is it signaled? Is it SIDMAN? Is it shock frequency reduction? Is it delay to gratification, or I should say delay to escape and avoidance kinds of paradigms? These are the variables that we really need to address because it's not enough to simply do on a functional assessment. We need to know a great deal more about the variables under which uh, our consumers, our children, the people that are important to us are operating under. And to do so, we really need to have a very clear understanding of all of the various uh, contingencies that impinge upon people that lead to either good decisions or bad decisions. Well, I, I, I know that uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking about this. It was necessary. You probably now know more about negative reinforcement than many other people who are you know, uh, out there doing behavior analysis. And I hope that this information is useful for you. Um, so what I will do now is uh, end the session and see you guys uh, soon for behavior reduction. Take care.